Mwangi Kanyari is a grandfather and farmer. At 82, he doesn't work at the same pace as before, but most days still find him tending his small holding here in the Kenyan highlands. During the Second World War, he joined the British Army, fighting alongside white Kenyans against the Germans in North Africa for six years. When the whites returned, they were given land and money. But when Kenyari came home, he realized not for the last time that Britain had different views on justice for black Kenyans. I was angry. After I came back from the war, the British gave me nothing. They didn't even consider me as having been one of them. They never remembered me. I was very angry to realize that all those years I'd just worked for the food I ate. They never paid me anything. The anger Kenyari felt was shared by many of his fellow Kikuyu, Kenya's majority tribe. British settlers had occupied the richest areas and blacks were second class. A group called Mau Mau had begun a secret campaign for land and independence. At first, it was peaceful. But some men did take up arms against the British. Kenyari was one of them. I wanted freedom. I wanted that very much. But they are the ones who forced us into a war that we didn't want. None of us signed up for a war. When they declared a state of emergency, they just started killing and beating us. None of us expected that. In Nairobi, capital of Kenya, Europeans and Africans still walk the streets in fear of the dreaded Mau Mau. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. But no whites had been killed prior to the emergency. Most deaths came in fights between Mau Mau and black Kenyans loyal to Britain. There was a huge sense of betrayal. Britain had come to civilize the Africans, and now instead of being thankful, they'd return to jungle savagery. White farmers felt vulnerable, living in fear of their servants. They described the people on the other side in the forest as people who had lost all contact with humanity and had virtually become animals. John Nottingham was a young district officer. Kenya was his first posting and initially he went along with the official line. There was absolutely no question, absolutely no question. These were people who had to be totally destroyed. Their movement had to be totally destroyed. If we needed more uh, force, more oppression, then we had to bring in more troops. We had, to, we had to solve this somehow, and we had to solve it as quickly as possible. They traveled deeper, ever deeper, into the heart of the African jungle. For here, many of the Mau Mau are hiding. Within two years, Britain had won the military war in the forest. The Mau Mau must be hunted out so that peace may come to this troubled colony. Now all civilians were rounded up and screened for their loyalties. Women and children were dispatched to concentrated villages. Men were detained in camps while their allegiances were determined. Internment camps have been established. The official camp directives state that their aim is the rehabilitation of internees by hard work and discipline, by propaganda, by religious, education and other means. That was the official story. Caroline Elkins is one of the youngest history professors at Harvard University. Six years ago, she started researching how the British successfully put down a rebellion and rehabilitated an entire tribe. Today, she's back with her research assistant, Terry, traveling around the highlands, visiting some of the hundreds of people she interviewed back then. 
And I spent these two and a half years looking not just at the public record office, but looking elsewhere, looking here in Kenya, looking at private archives, speaking with a variety of different people, most importantly the detainees and the villagers in the field itself, former missionaries, colonial officers, European settlers. It was a really quite a bit of a mosaic putting all of this together. And the pattern Caroline found was in stark contrast to the official line. Shedrak Kani was at five different camps. At least 80,000 men were detained during the emergency. Together, these men have spent nearly 25 years behind the wire. Today, they relate some of their worst experiences, but say they are typical of camp life. I even saw a man at compound 2 McKinnon Road, forced to drink a full bucket of water by a white man nicknamed the Whip. They beat him until he'd drunk so much water that his stomach swelled and it started coming out of his mouth, nose and ears. Eventually he died. All told similar stories. Their treatment went far beyond ordinary discipline. In our case, a white man, the district commissioner himself was supervising us. He would wait for us to load the crushed stones into iron buckets. Then he would follow us in his Land Rover as we ran to the building site. If he thought we were working too slowly, he made us stop and ordered the guards to beat us. We started running like bullets to avoid the beatings. And did people die doing this? People were getting sick all the time. Some people were beaten so badly they got internal injuries. If someone collapsed, they would be taken to hospital. Many people never came back. They died there. So just to confirm, Terry, this British officer that he's talking about, who's chasing them in the Land River, this is the man who's in charge of the entire area? Yes, he's the one. OK. Then Caroline heard how a group was forced to strip naked and made to run until they collapsed. There was more. One of the men was made to put his head into a bucket of water. Then the white officer held one of the prisoner's legs aloft while a guard held the other. Then another guard brought some sand, which they started to push into the detainee's anus with a stick. They kept on doing this, alternately putting in sand and water, all the while pushing the mixture in with the stick. That's something I'd never seen before, or couldn't have imagined happening. That act still gives me nightmares to this day because that was something that should never be done to a human being. The colonial authorities wanted to modernize Kenya. To do so, they needed to develop its infrastructure. Because of the emergency, they had a captive workforce. Huge projects like this, the Yatta drainage system, were made with convict labor. So too were irrigation schemes, hospitals and vast quarries. But much of modern Kenya was built on blood. This runway of what's now Kenya's main airport was originally dug out by Mau Mau convicts. It was called Mbakazi and witnesses told us hundreds Perhaps thousands died of beating and exhaustion. Every working detail had to have 50 prisoners. 
By noon of each working day, up to six or seven prisoners had died. If a prisoner died, it was the men in his group who would put his body onto the vehicle that used to come round collecting the bodies. We learned the bodies were taken here to Kamiti prison, the only place where suspected Mama women were detained. Those inside saw the Embakazi lorries arriving. The lorry would tip the bodies into the ditch and then drive off. If many people had died, it would come at 10 in the morning and again at 2 in the afternoon. On days when not as many people died, only one lorry would come, but with bodies heaped to the top and planks of wood along the side to prevent them from falling off. They never used to bury the bodies. They were just dumped like logs until the ditch was full higher than this house. Soon a whole gulag of camps sprang up, dedicated to turning Mau Mau into honest citizens, mostly in Kikuyu land in central province. One set of camps was called Mwea. Theba, one of the Mwea camps. All Mau Mau had taken secret oaths binding them to their freedom fight. There were strict orders never to reveal them to anyone. But the British would only release men once they had recanted. They called it screening. People were always badly beaten when they were being screened. Some would be hardened by the beatings, so no matter how long they went on, they wouldn't confess. They'd say, just kill us. Is this, is this where it happened here? Yeah. Extraordinarily, the very cell to which Kanyari was taken still exists. He'd not been back for nearly 50 years, but today he took us to the place that changed his life forever. Kanyari fought for Mau Mau for three years before being captured. Hmm. This is the place. Okay. Yeah. No, be careful, be careful. So they hang you upside down here. Uh, yeah, yes, I see. Be careful, please. He told me how naked, tied by his feet to the bars, he was brutally beaten on the testicles with a stick. They were being hung. Look at Be careful, be careful. Then they seared his eyes with hot coals. They kept him there for eight days. Okay. Ooh, are you okay? Nandakulio 
Unaolinga ni unamweka. Ugondee kio. Mm. See here. Mm. That's a scar. That was the operation afterwards. Yes. Yes. Nyondo akuto hakame. Who did this to you? Mudongo pia tawai karacho. What do you feel in your heart now about the men that did this to you? I feel very, very bad. If they had just killed me, I would have been at peace. Instead, they gave me so much pain. I couldn't have children. I'm poor. I'm just a piece of scrap. To get an idea of what was officially known during the emergency, we visited Kenya's National Archives in Nairobi. Some journalists and MPs did uncover abuses, but they were always told incidents were one-offs. And the government covered its tracks by ordering mass destruction of key documents. But they couldn't get rid of everything. Some letters from detainees smuggled out from the camps survived. There should be hundreds of thousands of documents on the detention camp system alone, but the truth is that there are very few, and the reason for that is that the colonial government ordered them all to be destroyed, burnt and shredded. There are some that do still exist, and these come, the most interesting ones anyway, I think, come from the prisoners who sent out letters to the Queen at the time and to the Commissioner of Police and uh, they allege all manner of brutality, starvation, malnutrition, beatings, suffocation. And the way that these are dealt with by the authorities is also pretty significant in that they don't order investigations into the maltreatment, but into how the letters should be stopped from going out. This office is being inundated with a number of petitions from inmates of various detention camps. I fully realise the difficulties involved in controlling this illegal flow of correspondence, but wonder whether tighter measures could not be introduced, if not to stop it, at least to reduce it. Far from the camps lay another theatre of the war. Here it was women and children in the front line. They are searched before leaving the area and then thoroughly screened by police. As native police are called to surround the area, the village is evacuated in a matter of minutes. Food is left in cooking pots. In an early example of ethnic cleansing, the entire Kikuyu people were forcibly uprooted from their homes. Inhabitants are allowed to salvage some of their possessions. They were put into special villages. Here they were both protected from Mama attack and stopped from giving them food. But it was these villages which saw some of the worst atrocities of the war. Susan Nyereri was a young woman with two children when she was forced into a village. Today she is poor and life for this 78-year-old is tough. On her shamba or small holding, she keeps a few animals but has little else. But compared to the days of villagization, she's well off. Then they were penned in 30 to a hut, plagued by violence, disease and starvation. Women face the daily dilemma of being caught between two warring factions. Our worst problem was that during the night, the Mau Mau would come, forcing us to give them food. Early the following morning, 
The security people would come, bundle us out of our houses, beating us with their guns. They would demand that we produce the Mau Mau hiding in our houses. But we had no idea where they were. They had come during the night and left. Today, Susan ekes out a living on borrowed land. But she remembers how in the concentrated villages, hunger was the biggest problem. They only had a few hours a week to gather food and mothers often couldn't provide for their children. Thousands died of starvation. Susan recalls the day she went to the white officer in charge of her village's guard post. Once they beat me with my baby on my back, I'd asked to be excused from communal work because my child was sick. They said, don't worry, we have enough hoes and shovels to bury your child if he dies. <coughs> it was agonizing. Even as we were being beaten, my son was too sick to make a sound. He died soon after that. Nearly 50 years later, that day still haunts her. In here? Here he is. Mm -hmm. So how many people have been buried here? Hmm. Hmm. Very many. This is a mass grave of sorts. Each grave is marked with a sisal plant. During her research days, Caroline Elkin spent much time in central Kenya, talking to women about their days in the concentrated villages. Today, she's back and there's great excitement. When Caroline came here last, it was the first time anyone had listened to their stories. Memories have long been suppressed. <laughs> During the emergency, many Kenyans loyal to Britain committed abuses, and many of them moved into positions of power after independence. So, people kept their suffering to themselves. <laughs> Today, new women are here who want to tell Caroline their story. <laughs> It was bad, bad, bad. We had horrible problems. Hunger was the worst. Even as we were starving, we were forced to do hard labor, digging trenches that never seemed to end. They woke us while it was still dark, and as we walked to work, the guards would be beating us. Can you ask her, while working, about how many people she saw dying like this. I'd see four or five people die one day. The next day, the same again. The day after that, the same again. Every woman here lost a relative. The weakest went first, old parents and young children. One thing gave me so much pain and sorrow that I didn't know if I was alive or dead. They came at their usual time at 3 a.m. 
There were a lot of British soldiers and a few black ones. They set on me with the butt of their guns. I was thrown from one soldier to the next. They didn't care where they hit me. As this was going on, my two-and-a-half-year-old child screamed and ran to me, passing between the legs of the soldiers. As I was being beaten, he was trying to hide between my legs. That's when they trampled him. As they led me away, the last thing I saw was my child lying there, dead. The women told how they were routinely raped and assaulted by loyalists, police and British soldiers. Hit worst were the wives of forest fighters. They didn't care if they found you with your mother or other members of your family. They'd just take you aside and rape you right there. That's something that hurt me personally very much, even today, because it's not something I'd planned or wanted. And this didn't happen just once, it happened many times. And were these Africans or British soldiers or both, as she described before? Mm -hmm. She said they were white British soldiers. Mm -hmm. did, did any young woman um, escape from this being done to her? No, they said, if you refused, you were killed. When you conduct these interviews, you're immediately reminded of what happened in places like Nazi Germany and elsewhere. Things that were being fought against, you know, the liberation of, for democracy in World War II. Meanwhile, here in the back door in Kenya and their empire, they're perpetrating the same types of crimes. War crimes, people, things that people were being tried for back in Europe were happening in, in Kenya at the very same time almost. Given what went on in the villages, it was always going to be extremely hard when the men came home. When Kenyari went to join Mau Mau, he left behind his wife and two young sons. On his return after three years in detention, Kenyari found his home had been burned and his livestock stolen. When he'd left the camp, the British had pronounced him rehabilitated and ready to return to village life. But everything had changed. I'd come back to find that my children had died. What could I do? I just prayed for strength from God who'd given them to me. I'd just come back from a terrible place only to find that my mother had been killed. My father was dead. But I had my wife and I had to go on. My mother had been shot as she tried to stop them taking her cows. It was just too much. But I couldn't just take a rope and hang myself. They'd castrated him with their blows. Since then, I've never been able to sleep with him. I struggled with this, and it took me a long time before I could think about having more children. He couldn't give me any. But after a while, we took the decision that I should try to have children anyway to carry on his name. I decided to persevere rather than leave him like other women were doing. Eventually, they did start a new family. Esther Kenyari had four children, each by a different biological father. Her husband accepted them as his own. 